Happy Sabbath, Church. Let's go in quickly to the book of Exodus, chapter 14. The first time we talked about God leading the Israelites out of Egypt, and that was in Exodus chapter 12. Uh, we learned that they had to do, the first thing is to kill a lamb, the Passover, and eat it with bitter herb roasted in fire. And the bitter herb meant supplication. And the lamb represents Jesus Christ that would die for our sin. Amen? Okay. So now that they have left Egypt and they are on the journey and God is leading them through the sanctuary, let's see what the next step would be once they had gone through the altar of sacrifice. And let's now read in verse 13, uh, chapter 13, first, verse 17. And he says, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, Let's peradventure the people will repent when they see war and return to Egypt. Why did God not want to lead, to lead them through the way of the Philistine? If they see war, what would they do? Go back to Egypt. If they go back to Egypt, what, what would they be doing again in Egypt? Becoming slaves. Are we also not slaves of something? What are we slaves of? Hold on. Hold your finger here and let's go to John chapter 8. Let's go to John chapter 8 and see what we are slaves of. If you look in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And some might say, slave of sin. So we know that if we return to sin, we are going to be what? Slave of sin. The same way, if they return to Egypt, they will become again slaves. Is that point clear? Let's move on. Verse 18. But God led them, or led the people, about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the, the land of Egypt. Now let's keep on down to verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Let's suppose, let's put in an application into our lifetime right now, all right? Let's suppose you are driving down the road and it's 12 o'clock, and you are getting hit by the sun. Would you know that? Would you know if you are getting hit by the sun? Yeah. Let's suppose also you're driving down the road and it's 12 o'clock p.m. and you are not hit by the sun. Would you know that? If there's a shade, would you know that there's a cloud above you? Yes. So do the Israelites know that God is with them. Why? Because by day, God was protecting them through a cloud. 
against what? The heat of the sun. And it gets cold at night. What did God do? A pillar of fire. So you would definitely know that God is with you. Now, in our time, do we know that God is with us always? How do we know that? Let's go again to Matthew chapter 28, the last verses, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and, and, and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father's name, the Son, and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, what is the next? I am with you, how? Today? Tomorrow? Always, even unto the end of ages. So do we have the assurance that God is with us always? When, when they left Egypt, did God not start with them from Egypt all the way to the Red Sea? Yes. So they know that God is with them. If they can look up and just see the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, they would know that God is with them. Now, let's enter in chapter 14. And this is right before the Red Sea. Verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they, might, that they turn and encamp before Pihiroth, between Midgard and the sea, over against Baal-Zephon, before it shall, ye shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel that they are entangled in the land the wilderness had shut them in. Question again. Did God not tell Moses that they would reach a dead end? So if you are on the way and you are shot in a place, what does that mean? Can you go further? Can you go on the side? Yeah. Now, they were shot in the, uh, in the wilderness. Why? Because did they have the Red Sea in front of them. Could they go anywhere? They couldn't. How many of you like to drive? Okay. How many of you like to drive with a GPS? Okay. How many of you driven and the GPS tells you to go to the right and there you got a dead end? What do you do then? Do you just say, Lord, open the way for me, or do you just turn around? Exactly. So God told them, you guys would get to a what? A dead end. You can go left, no right. You can go far because if you go to the sea, I mean, probably there's crocodiles and sharks maybe, and they cannot go back. Now, let's see what Pharaoh does next. In chapter 14, verse 5, he says, Anyone told the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants were turned against the people and said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? Now, what is the purpose of Pharaoh now? He wants to go back and, and catch them to bring them back to what? To Egypt to, for them to what? To serve him. And let's keep on down to verse 9. And he says, But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Bahazephon. In verse 10, And Pharaoh drew nigh, and when Pharaoh drew nigh, 
the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were so afraid, and they cried unto the Lord. Did the army of Pharaoh catch them by the sea? Could they go anywhere? You can't go left, you can't go right. There's a red sea in front of you, and now your enemies are coming behind you. What are you going to do? Now, let's see if they actually trusted in God. Let's see. Now, you said that they cried to the Lord, right? When you cry to the Lord, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Say that again. Exactly. Do you know that there are some cries to the Lord that are not godly cry? Let's check. Verse 11. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is it not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us what? No. Oh, that we may do what? Serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Wait a minute. When Jesus Christ is telling us to live a holy life, what do, we, what do we respond to him? And you know, to live a holy life, you have to go through what? Tribulations. And most of the time, we don't like tribulations, do we? Do we like trials? No. And when we go to trials, what do we do? Do you not say, you see, God, I told you, if I had been in my sin, I would not have been in that trial. Did they cry to the Lord? Yes. But what kind of cry? Do you know that there was some cry that actually grieves the Holy Spirit? Let's turn to First Thessalonians. Last quarterly, we studied the Holy Spirit and spirituality. And Mary gave us an example of when you complain to God, it can also grieve the Holy Spirit. Let's check if that's true. First Thessalonians chapter 5, let's read from verse 16. And it says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Did you say in some time or in something or in everything? That means even the tribulations that God allows you to go through, you should thank God for that. That's character building. Now, I'm going to say this. Most of us here, or except for me, I don't. Most of parents here had kids. And sometimes they would be crying, right? And the first time you would pick them up and they stop crying. And they do it again and again. After a certain time, what do you do? Do you still take them or you just let them cry? Or do you punish them? Notice, every one of them went through what? the altar of sacrifice. They all killed the lamb. They all ate the flesh, roasted in fire with bitter herb. But now we are faced with a Red Sea. Tribulations. Did you know that the Red Sea is part of God's way of salvation? Let's check. Let's, let's confirm this. Let's go to Psalms. Psalm 77. And we know that in verse 13, it says, and now we're actually studying the sanctuary. Verse 13 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. But let's keep on down to verse 18 and 19 and 20. And it says, The voice of thy thunder, 
This is chapter 77 of Psalms, verse 18. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven, the lightnings lightened the world, the earth trembled and shook. Thy way is in the what? In the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou leadest thy people like a flock, like a flock, by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Which sea did God lead Moses and Aaron through? Hmm. So do you think we are not supposed to go through a Red Sea also? Now, I'm not asking you to go and fly to the Middle East and get on a boat to the Red Sea, but spiritually speaking, we are to be going through a Red Sea. Now, we see that be, even though they all went through that out of sacrifice, but none of, not all of them were converted. Remember the out of sacrifice, the self-denial, repentance? They all did, but not all of them were converted. Why? Because here you see that they were complaining. They forgot that God was with them. They stopped looking up because when they saw the Egyptians, they saw what? Fear. But if they had looked up, they, have, they would have remembered that God was with them. And that same God that took them out of Egypt could deliver them. Because of that, their faith sunk. What was their faith? They had none. Why? Because they didn't want to be in trouble again. How many times do we get into trouble and we forget to look up to God for the answer? Hmm. Now I wonder if we do that nowadays. Remember I said we're, gonna, we're going to see some present truth also? I want, or we're going to get there soon. I wonder if we are doing the same thing. The Red Sea also represents what? Baptism. Remember the first step in, in the sanctuary? You see, you have the altar of sacrifice, offering, then the laver. At the altar of sacrifice, you what? You kill a lamb. What's next? The laver. First thing you do, repent. Second thing you do is what? Baptism. And this is the way how it looks in the Sudan of Sacrifice and the labor. But sometimes people say that repentance comes at the labor, at baptism. Is this true? We'll see. Actually, it's not true because repentance do, does not come at baptism. Last year, last quarter, we studied the Holy Spirit and spirituality. And it says, baptism is a positive step with which all who wish to be acknowledged as under the authority of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit must comply. In other words, <coughs> baptism marks true repentance. Is this true? Do you decide to get repentance when you, bapti when you get baptized? Or is it before you get baptized? Friends, baptism is only a certificate that says you actually repented before that. Repentance comes at the altar of sacrifice. Deny yourself before you get baptized. We'll see if that's true. Oh, Ellen White says that the steps are repentance, faith, and baptism. So you cannot be baptized without, actually, let me say that, let me say that in a better word. You cannot get repentance at baptism. It comes before baptism. If I had to be baptized to be to get repentance, that's not how it works. Because the steps 
the, work, the, the steps every sinner has to take to be saved. First, repentance, then faith, and then baptism. Okay. Now, do we actually, I'm going to say this. Uh, okay. I'm going to skip some of these. But let me, okay, not that. Okay. Question. How many of you love, brotherly love, LGBT people? Okay. That's a, you see, I said brotherly love. That doesn't mean we need to accept everything they do. Right? We need to love the sinner, but hate who, what? The sin. That's right. How many of you know Loma Linda University in California? Okay. They had a conference, and six people actually spoke at that conference. First one, he says that James Walter, the Southern Avenue Church must grant the same rights to LGBTQ individuals as the United States Supreme Court did in June 2015. Okay. The second person says, I have felt gay, born gay, grew up gay, and so on. Friends, I don't know about you, but I've never heard people being born gay. If it's true, let me know because I don't know that. Now, I am not speaking against them. I'm speaking against what they do, their lifestyle. That's two different things. I actually work with people that smoke. I love them, but the idea of smoking, I don't like it. Don't forget that. Now, let's see how we have become to be people that are against the word of God. You want to see that? Watch this. Oh, let me go back, actually. I want you to see something. The last word, the last sentence, yellow words, this is Great Controversy, page 41, paragraph 1, page 42, paragraph 1. The last sentence is, with some concession on their part, they propose that Christians should make concessions that all might unite on the platform of belief in Christ. Don't forget those words, belief in Christ, because you're going to see it again. Okay? Don't forget those words. Now let's see. Let's move on. And she says, the Seventh-day Adventist Church must accept LGBT individuals as members because they are Seventh-day Adventists. What's the next word? Believe in Jesus Christ. Then she goes down to say the next, next sentence, Pope Francis is our model. Now, I don't know about you if you're a Christian, but my model is this. How about you? So we can know that they are not feeding of the word of God, but just as in the Bible says, they will be feeding from what? From the wine of the fornication of Babylon. Okay, Jonathan Paulian. Now he says that Paul knew nothing about our sexual orientation today because they live in a different era. I wonder. What era was Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> now, I see, okay, I see you laughing, but this is reality, my friend. This is present truth. I am not making this up. This is what's happening right now in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You see, I am not going out to other churches. I'm staying in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What, what era was Sodom and Gomorrah? That was way back. Yeah. What did God do to them? Destroy them. Why? 
do you, you know, I'm gonna say this, we are almost close to the time of Sodom and Gomorrah again. History repeats itself. We are getting into that moment again of Sodom and Gomorrah, as you're gonna see later. You will see one that is even worse than that. But then on the second paragraph he says, heterosexuality is only an ideal. Homosexuality is the reality because of Romans 3, 23. Wait, what does woman to be verse 22 says, say? For all have and have fallen short from the... So basically, and you know that God's ideal is for us to be what? Perfect, holy. But no, the reality is to stay in your sin. Are, are we now baptizing people in their sin? You will see. Next, David Lawson and those were the seven professed seven day Adventist people, ministers and teachers at Lumanda University. Those are the ones. He says on the top, if I am a second day Adventist, out of seven options, only two is true. Which are the last ones? The last two are the ones that he would do. First one is bad, commit suicide, you shall not kill. Right? That's bad. Two, stay in a closet, depression, that's also bad. Three, marry a person of opposite sex. Huh. Remember that his friend said heterosexuality is only an ideal? He's also agreeing with it. Four, Seek change therapy by praying, and that doesn't work. Five, engage in promiscuity, that's not, that's not good. Six, celibacy, stay single. He says, okay, that, I will do that. And seven, form a loving, lasting union akin to marriage. What does akin mean? Close. Close, what is close to, uh, to the marriage that God had Put. Let me say this, same-sex marriage. I mean, if you don't want to say it, I'll say it for you. Then on the bottom it says, the sex texts, yellow words, that are usually used to clobber or condemn people who practice LGBTQ lifetime should what? These are professed Seventh-day Adventist church people. They are in war against the word of God. And then let us just love everyone. Now, like I said, I don't hate them. I just hate their lifestyle. You need to love them, but speak against what they do. Jesus loved the Pharisees, but how many times did he speak against their wrongdoings? Oh, many times. Now, I'm going to say this. This is the biggest, most, and worst abominable words I've ever heard. You know what it is? Then in acres. What's this? What's this in the little words? Now, if you know the Bible, you know that's not true. How many fathers did Jesus have? Why do you say one? I know it's only one, but she said he had two, right? Let me, let me say this. Every time that the angel came to Joseph, what did he say to him? Joseph, get the mother and the child. Did he say get your wife and your child? And that means Joseph was always out of the picture. And she says, we affirm LGBT lifestyle. Are we now in war against the word of God? Now I ask you the question, if we actually baptize people in their sin, but let me show you, I'm not gonna tell you, I'm gonna show you instead. No, okay, they were, that was like a coming out ministry that was trying to go to Pasadena in California and the church 
closed their door because they were anti-LGBT. And they were the ones that were LGBT people and they got victory over sin. And the church closed their door to them. Okay? Uh, Ryan Bell. Who knows Ryan Bell? I don't know him until now. He says, in other words, the existence of God seems like an extra layer of complexity that is not necessary. And then he goes on to say, the intellectual and emotional energy it takes to figure out how God fits into everything is far greater than dealing with reality as it presents itself to us. What are they saying now? Forget about God. Just live on to what? The reality. Not the ideal, but the reality. You see, I said I would show you present truth because at this time, there are things going on in our church we don't even know about. Now, Adventist Today, that's a website. Ma Baptism of Married Lesbian at Chico Adventist Church. Let me show you the title actually for that. Ordained woman pastor baptizes a lesbian SDA married to lesbian member. How would you feel if here there is a couple, two women, married, one is a member already, and then you baptize the, I don't know, I should say wife or husband in the same church. Are we, are we teaching them to go through the altar of sacrifice, repentance? Or do we just want to baptize? Now, I know that the number of members are falling down, but that's not an excuse to just baptize people without repentance. And it's actually she's practicing it. She never actually had repentance. Friends, this is our time. But let's see. Let's move on. Ellen White says, it is the what we need today? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. If we do not have the Holy Spirit, friends, we will baptize people in their sin. Now, she mentioned something, and do you know what it means to baptize people that are not converted? Do you know what it means? No? Okay, I'll let you know. There have ever been two classes among those who profess to be followers of Christ. While one class studied the Savior's life and earnestly seek to, con to correct their defects and conform to the pattern, the other class shunned the plain practical truth which exposed their errors. And then she started talking about Judas, and I picked up there. I said, Judas yielded his mind to the control of the powers of darkness. He became angry when his faults were reproved and thus, he was led to commit the fearful crime of betraying his master. When you tell someone that they made a mistake, they're not living according to the word of God, and they get mad at you, that's a sign they are not converted. Just as Judas. And people think being a Christian means to follow Christ. Judas was following Christ. But he wasn't a Christian. And, it's, and she goes on to say, So do all who what? Cherish evil under a profession of godliness, hate those who disturb their peace by condemning their course of sin. When a favorable opportunity is presented, they will, like Judas, betray those who for their good had sought to reprove them. That's what it means when you baptize someone who is half converted. Now, question again. How many of you love LGBT people?
How many of you would want to stay or to work with them also? Like I said, I work with people that tell you that smoke, but I talk to them like I never knew if they smoke. We need to love the sinner and hate the sin. Because if you hate them, how can you preach to them? If you hate someone, would you ever tell that someone any truth? No. But if you love them and they see your character and they see Christ in you, yeah, they will change later. But if we baptize them in their sin or offense, if, we, if they do not repent and we just baptize them because they say they believe in Jesus Christ, they, like Judas, will be one of them. We'll be like Judas betraying those who actually was trying to help them to get to Christ. But how do you do that? Do you just come to them and then tell them that they're going to hell? No. You must show them that you love them. And actually, you need to love them for real. Watch this. People that have a form of godliness. Form of godliness means you are not godly. And people that have a form of godliness won't make it to heaven either. If you want to show you are godly from the outside and you are not godly on the inside, the good news is, <laughs> God knows your heart. The bad news is, God knows your heart. Oh yeah, I learned that, that sentence during the week. So having a form of godliness is being, me actually means you are ungodly. Let us not forget, first thing, repentance, the altar of sacrifice. And second thing, faith. And third step, baptism. And we need to actually tell them also, the first thing they need to do is to come to Christ. Repent from their sin because God is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9. And this, it is my prayer for me and for you. Amen. Amen.